guys are such nerds. <laughs> oh, Steve, I'm going to get you back to that one, buddy. Um, well, I apologize for my voice. Um, I helped coach high school football down at Churchill, and I went into the game saying, don't scream the whole game. And I screamed the whole game. So here I am struggling with that. Um, no, I'm uh, really excited to be here. Um, I love sharing Christ. I love inspiring hearts and giving encouragement. I love that our church makes us talk to neighbors all the time. So would you turn to your neighbor and just say, God loves you. I love it. Would you do me a favor? Would you turn to the other neighbor you ignored for some reason and say, God loves you too. That, that would help. Doesn't that feel good for the person who got left out? I'm usually always the one who gets left out. But no, I'm excited to share today. I told Wayne I would do just well enough for you guys to miss him. So uh, I think you'll be encouraged uh, when he gets back, especially. Um, you know, for me, football was just something that was a part of my life for a long time. Uh, I played here at the University of Oregon uh, a long time ago and then went on and played for the Green Bay Packers and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And one year with the Redskins, uh, they changed their name and it's kind of dumb, so I won't say it, but... Um, <laughs> In fact, just some house cleaning. If there's any Bears fans here, we do have an overflow room upstairs. So if you're more comfortable up there, I, I, I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, no, if you wanted to know anything about uh, uh, me personally, the most important thing about me is that I am a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. He's been my best friend for most of my life. I gave my heart to him in high school. He's never let me down. He is the joy of my life, and he's provided me with so many blessings in my life, but I refuse to worship the blessings over the blesser, and I hope that that's something that you'll get from today's message as well. Um, I want to open us up in prayer, though. I want to invite God to speak, not just through me and not just through some notes, because he preached this message to my heart. I never share a prepared message that wasn't given to me to be lived through me. And so I'm just going to share with you what God has shared with me. But I want to invite him to do that uh, with his power and not mine. Lord, we love you and we're so thankful for this morning. Father, there were many people in the world that went to sleep last night and didn't wake up this side of eternity. But you woke us up and you have a purpose and you have a plan for our lives. This service, this message, this time right now is part of that plan. You know what is going on in the minds and hearts of every soul in this room, myself included, and I pray that you would meet the needs that only you can meet in those hearts through our time together and our worship. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I try to live my life to the best of my ability to honor my best friend, Jesus. I don't always do a great job of that. I let him down every single day, but he always restores me. He always fixes me. He's always there to regenerate me because of his mercy and his grace. And that's the thing I love most about Jesus is how forgiving he is and how quick he is there to pick us up and to take us forward. And today's message, I hope, will start to maybe have you take that next step in your walk with God. Maybe you don't know God, or maybe you've walked with him for a long time. We all have another step on the ladder that we can take in our walk with him. Now, I've been a big Billy Graham fan for a long, long time. In fact, one of my teammates married Franklin Graham's daughter, so Billy Graham's granddaughter. So that was kind of a cool connection. They, were, they actually lived in our house uh, his rookie year. But Billy Graham has just been so, so fun for me. I listen to him every single day. I love his messages on XM Radio, or I just look some of them up. Uh, but he was telling a story of a time when he was coming back from a trip back east, and he was flying. This was back in the old days. But he was flying on a plane, and there was an obnoxious drunk guy on the plane. And he said, this guy was making everybody upset. He was being really obnoxious. He was not treating the, the flight attendants very well. And finally, some guy got up and said to this man, hey, do you know who's sitting right here? And pointed to Billy Graham's seat. And he's like, no, I don't know who that is. And he goes, that's Billy Graham, the preacher, thinking maybe that would kind of inspire some behavior out of this guy. And he goes, you don't say. So he walks up to Billy Graham's seat, and he reaches out his hand. He says, put her there. Your sermon sure have helped me. I, I hope that this message helps you better than it helped that guy. 
But I've often heard that the role of a pastor is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I hope that today a little bit of that is happening to both sides of that coin. Because I'm wanting your hearts to connect to Jesus. You know, I've been very privileged to have um, the, the opportunity to be the chaplain for the Oregon Duck football team. It's basically team pastor, where I meet these guys twice a week for chapels. I meet them one-on-one. I get late-night calls. I, whatever I can do. But every bit of advice I'm going to give to these young men is going to come from my heart and God's word. And I'm trying to show them that they need God in a deeper way. And I'm so honored, and I thank God that he's given me that opportunity to do that, because when we really think about our lives, we always find ourselves feeling like we're missing out on something at some point of our lives or another. And I want to talk about that missing piece in a little bit. But as chaplain, when I talk about that to these guys, it's usually because they're blinded by their dreams in football. And their eyes are taken away from God, and my job is to redirect their eyes back to God. And I hope that we can do that today together. Now, you're going to hear a familiar story, and I I don't want you to uh, say to yourself, yeah, I've heard this story before. This is great. This will be a good one. Because God's Word is living and active, and so this will be a truth and a story out of the Scriptures that you've heard before. But what I'm hoping is that you'll see a new truth today. Because you're different today than you were maybe the last time you heard it. God's doing something different in your life today than maybe a couple months ago or a couple years ago or whenever it was that you last heard this. I remember when I was with the Green Bay Packers, we would get up early in the morning every day, and this was halfway through the season, and everything's the same in in professional football. Routine is very important. It helps keep people stable and kind of helps us to get through recoveries and things like that. So we got up in the middle of the season one morning, drove to the facility, walked into one of the team rooms, there's a big theater screen, and typically the coach will turn the lights out, get his clicker out and his little red dot, and he would play film. And we would scout the other team or we would scout ourselves through practice and we would watch game film. And this was the same thing that we would do all the time. Only this morning when we sat in there, the coach didn't turn the lights out right away, which was a normal routine. He turned around and he faced us like I'm facing you. And he said, guys, I know that we're about to watch some of the same film that we've watched over and over. And I know that you're about to hear the same voice that you've been listening to for months and months. But you're here now. You can't leave. You're stuck. Now, I couldn't leave. They'd fire me. You guys could leave, but that'd just be rude. (laughs) He says, you're here now. So you have to make a choice. You can either maximize your time today, or you can just get through it and not get anything out of it. And so I'm hoping that, like me, when I hear a familiar verse, I don't tune it out. I say, God, what are you doing with me in this verse today? What is it about this verse that's meeting a need in my heart today? And the verses uh, that we'll look at in a little bit is one that is super, super popular, and it's a great encouragement to all of us. Well, I find myself nowadays having a lot of random conversations. Maybe you guys are having these too. People are in need out there, are they not? There's so many needs out there that people are searching for so many different things all over society, all over the world. And I'm having so many random conversations with different people, and I can identify what's happening, but they just can't see it. In fact, two weeks ago when the Ducks played BYU here, I don't know if you saw that. It was a great game. They had a great chapel the night before. Uh, That's why they won. Uh, I'm on the sideline, and it's in the first quarter. And one of my former Duck teammates from 25 years ago was down there, and I hadn't seen him in a while. And I was thinking, oh, man, this is great to see you. And we're having a conversation during the game on the sideline. And he works for Nike, and he's had a great job, and so he does a lot of work with the team. And it quickly went to him starting to reveal that his life is in total shambles. Now, if you look at him, he's well-dressed, he's well-fed, he's well-compensated, and he's been all over the United States, all over the world for his great job. But he's on the sideline, and he's confessing that I'm miserable, I'm finalizing a very hard divorce, I hardly ever see my child, and I am not happy. And we had a long conversation on that sideline. And when I was chatting with him, he kept trying to steer the conversation to 
positivity. I'm just trying to get my life into more positivity and more positive areas and more positive relationships. And after a while, I kept trying to steer it back to the Lord, to the things that meant something. And I finally stopped him from talking. And I said, can I just give you some advice? Do you want good advice or do you want the answer? And he kind of looked at me like, whoa. I said, you need Jesus. He said, you've tried everything but him your whole life, and it hasn't worked. What is stopping you? The definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. And I pointed to the 50,000 people in the stands during the game who aren't paying attention to us or watching these guys, and I said, look around here. All of these people in this stadium, most of them in 60 years are not going to be here anymore. Their bodies will die, but their souls will live forever. What really matters is not positivity. It's not trying to find happiness, whatever that is with the lowercase h. You need Jesus. Why are you running from him? And we have the type of relationship that he was able to take that information. And I saw his eyes kind of pan up, and I could tell he was in thought. And then he had to go. He had work to do. And I was on the sideline there to be for the guys and the coaches. And we kind of parted ways. And he said he'd reach back out to me. And I can't wait for that call and that conversation. But what I realized was, like so many other people, he's saying, I've tried everything. I want happiness, and I can't seem to find it. He's tried everything but God. And that, for me, is so painful to see. One of my greatest fears is to see the hopeless soul. I want them to have what I have, total eternal security, complete happiness, even on days when I'm not feeling well and things aren't going well. I have the joy in my heart that Jesus is there and he's going to use it and he's going to grow me from whatever it is I'm going through. I'm never disappointed in God. But man, I'm so fearful when I see the hopeless that are. And I saw my friend in the heartache and I look around and I have these conversations all the time. And I think you just need the Lord. But for some reason, people don't go to him. And maybe you're sitting in here and you're saying, I've been trying so hard. I have I've tried sincerely to find happiness in my life. But something is missing. Well, there's a story of a man in that same situation. It's a story that is in the book of Matthew. It's about the rich young ruler. Pastor Wayne alluded to it. And I want to read through this section with you and then highlight a few things because this is a man who is very similar to my friend and very similar to so many other people that I've been talking to and interacting with for the past several years, especially through the COVID situation when they realized something's not right. Let's go ahead and read this together. It's found in Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Now, I have to admit, when I was reading this in the first service, I laughed. I don't know why I didn't notice this when I was looking through my notes and putting this together. Which ones? Jesus is like, well, which is your favorite? And we'll just work with those. (laughs) Obey me, you know, just in the areas that you want. We'll work this out, and I'll get rid of the other 10, you know? Like, it was funny that he said that, because, I mean, that maybe as kids, that's what kids will say. Like, well, do I have to do all the rules? Like, can I just, can we just agree on a few, and then I'll break all the rest of them? So he asked Jesus, which ones? Jesus didn't laugh at him like I would have. And Jesus replied to him, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he says an intriguing thing here that reveals something. He says, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away very sad because he had great wealth. Jesus isn't saying to all of us, if you're rich, you got to sell it all and follow me. 
what Jesus did here was he knows this man, doesn't he? He's God. He knows us all. He knows everything about us. We can't lie to God. We can't trick God. He knows everything about this guy. He knew that this man's riches were the wall of separation between him and God. And he wanted to reveal that to this man. But when it was revealed, this man went away very sad, the Bible says. The world would say this guy had it all together. He had everything that society says would make him happy. But he knew that it wasn't filling his soul. And it's interesting because at this point, Jesus had, he was in the thick of his ministry. He's been walking around doing miracles, healing people, preaching about the kingdom of God, making people know that they're connected to God the Father like they've never been before. But this man just didn't get it. But at least he went to Jesus. I'm proud of him for that point. But he's got everything that the world says he needs to be happy. He's young, presumably very healthy and vibrant. He's rich, he has wealth. The world tells him that'll make him truly happy. He's even a ruler. He's in charge. He's popular. He has societal status. Probably had a great Instagram account. (laughs) He is somebody that people look at and aspire to be because he has authority as a ruler. He was even very religious. Now, he kept the commandments. Remember that. Jesus gave him a list of commandments, and he left a couple out but he gave him a list of commandments. And he said, I've done all these things. I've been religious. I've watched myself in my life. He knew enough about God to feel the Holy Spirit surrounding him and saying, you need Jesus. What you're lacking is not being filled by the world. But his focus was on success and pleasures and religion. And it can't be that way. He thought he could work his way to heaven. What good thing must I do? Because I'm doing good things and it doesn't feel like enough. What more can I do, he asked Jesus, to get eternal life? He thought he could work his way to heaven. That was me when I was a little kid. I had, man, the Lord, I had no chance. I was gonna be a Christian whether I wanted to or not. He surrounded me with so many godly people, coaches, teachers, neighbors, best friends. And I remember I was really drawn to the goodness of those people. And I knew that they were Christians. And so what I did is I followed them around to the best of my ability. Stepped where they stepped, didn't step where they didn't step. Got good grades, was a very nice young man. But I always felt like I was missing something because I was trying to do the works of religion to attain some salvation from God without the power of God. And that's what's happening right here. He's trying to achieve a set of rules to accomplish a set of rules, to achieve something from God. And that's just not the way it works. We're not part of a religion, quote unquote. We're part of having a relationship with the creator of the universe and our savior, Jesus. Relationship is way different than religion. But he didn't get that. He lived in a society that told him very differently. You want happiness, become rich as early as you can, be a ruler, have status. All that money is gonna make you happy. And it just didn't and let him down. And he went to Jesus because he knew that. But you know what happens in life? It's often been said that many people have too much of the world in them to enjoy God, but also have too much of God in them to enjoy the world. They're stuck in the middle. So they're not satisfied with their relationship with God. They're not satisfied with their position in the world. And they're stuck in a void where they don't know what it is that they're missing. I remember when Tom Brady, the former quarterback of the Patriots, when he won his first Super Bowl, he was 21, 22, something like that. He was a young kid. Won his first Super Bowl. He did an interview a few weeks later on 60 Minutes or 2020 or something like that. And they were interviewing him about the the whole season. And of course, it was magical and euphoric and all this stuff. And he goes, but you know what was interesting? And he took the conversation here. He said, what was interesting was that night we celebrated as a team and our families I went to bed late. I woke up the next day. Nobody was around. It was completely quiet. And I sat up in bed and I looked around and I thought, is that it? There's got to be more. And I thought when I saw that interview, I was like, yeah, there is more, Tom. Well, I wish he would have listened to me and he wouldn't have hogged all those Super Bowls for the next 20 years. But 
The lie of the devil is that success and money and status and the world will satisfy your deepest longings. He knows it's a lie, but he's trying to shift your focus away from God. He wants you to worship the blessings rather than the blesser. If he can keep your eyes off of God, if he can keep your eyes off of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and keep you distracted, there's an open door for despair that he can insert into your life. But... J.D. Rockefeller said it the best. At one point, he owned 90% of all the world's energy. And at one point, his net worth was 1% of the entire U.S. economy. Richest man on the planet. And at the height of his wealth, somebody was interviewing him and asked him, you're the richest man on the planet. What, What is enough? And with a glean in his eye and no God in his heart, He said, just a little more. Just chasing a carrot he'll never get. Trying to fill a void with the world he'll never get. You see, Satan has two goals. He runs a lot of plays. He doesn't care which play works to get him there. He has two goals. His first goal is to keep people from knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord. And if he can't do that, if he can't pull that soul away from heaven, his second goal is to keep Christians quiet. If he can trap you in sin, if he can bring your eyes away from God to to look at the other stuff of the world and pull your heart connection away from God and bring despair into your life and distraction and bitterness and whatever it is, it will pull him away. He's He's not a greedy person. He'll use whatever to keep your eyes off of Jesus, to keep you from knowing Christ and to keep Christians quiet. Those are his two goals. And I feel like he did a good job with this rich young ruler because we don't see this young man ever again in the scriptures. In fact, in Mark chapter 10, the telling of this same story, Mark tells us that Jesus looked on him with love. You see, Jesus looks at us. He doesn't look down on us, but he's disappointed for us because he knows what we're missing out on. This guy looked at what he had to lose in his walk with Christ rather than all that he had to gain. And it's so despairing to see that. That was my friend on the sideline. He's been trying his entire life, everything but God. This entire time, he could have had God. And he wouldn't have been in that situation. He would have had joy in his heart and a purpose that he would be following as he followed Christ. But what we need to realize is what we started with in the beginning of this service. God loves you. God loves me. He loves us so much that if we were the only person on the planet, he would have still sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. Were that important to him? I don't even like me that much. I'm always blown away. My beautiful wife, Bethany, likes me a thousand percent more than I like myself. Infinitely more, God loves me and God loves you. But we don't focus on God's love. We focus on trying to balance just enough of God and just enough of the world, but it leaves us in a void that we can't get ourselves out of. This rich young ruler is a perfect example of that. What we need to do is to do what the scriptures say. Mark 8, 36 says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, one of my favorite verses, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know what that rest is? It's not a comforting word. It's the hope of salvation. Come to me, my children who know me, who've given their lives to me, who are gonna have eternal security with me, and I will give you rest in the hope of salvation. Remember, biblical hope is the absolute assurance of coming good, not worldly hope. Yesterday, I lost hope when I turned the game off because the Ducks were losing. And then I regained hope when I heard my kids upstairs screaming, yeah, they're coming back. That's worldly hope. But Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will let you rest in the hope of my salvation so that you don't feel like you're just enough of both sides that you're nowhere. In Matthew 6, the promise is, seek first in his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided unto you. Everything that you need. The Bible says he'll supply all your needs. Not all your greeds, all your needs. 
But if you're connected to Jesus Christ, you won't feel like you're lacking in anywhere. I would ask you if you're feeling lonely, it's because you're lonely for God. Genesis 126, you were created by God in his image for him. And a disconnect from God leaves you feeling void, leaves you feeling like you're missing out. If you're not satisfied in your life, it's because you've lost your connection to God somehow, some way. Maybe you haven't given your life to Jesus yet. It's gonna be a good opportunity for that here in a minute. But maybe you have, and like me, so many different times, I've rededicated my life countless times. There's no shame in that. God wants you to rededicate your life. Peter fell off uh, or walked off the boat, fell into the water, and rededicated his life to Jesus when he said, come save me. And Jesus was already there, ready to save him. When we give that void in our life something other than God, it will never satisfy. It's like eating chips when you're hungry. You eat some chips, you feel great. Two minutes later, you don't. It didn't work. It was a lie. Now, I have an illustration that I use with uh, some of the guys that I like. You're probably wondering if this is a rabbit or not. It's not. What I have here, obviously, is an hourglass. I love these things. They're kind of fun. But what I want to point out is what will be illustrated with this hourglass. Right now, we have sand in the top. And if this top portion represented a hole in our heart, because the Bible says we have a hole in our heart that only God can fill, But what happens to all of us, not just non-Christians, this was me before I gave my life to Christ, but as a believer, this has been me over and over again. What happens is I can fill the top with sand all the way to the top, and it will be full and flush. But what's going to happen over time? Just a few moments later, it starts to drip through, and it's not full anymore, and it's empty. And now my heart feels like, well, I'm missing something. Maybe I should throw some more sand in. Maybe I should get online and look, uh, look at Instagram up and find out how many likes I got. Oh, those likes made me feel good. Maybe I need to buy a new boat. That'll really make me feel good. Maybe you need to buy me a boat. That would really make me feel good. But we fill it with all sorts of sand apart from Christ. But what if we were to do what God told us to do? He's the rock of salvation. If I had a rock that perfectly formed that top section and I didn't have the sand, I dumped that sand out, that useless stuff of the world that I'm chasing down, and I grabbed that rock, that rock that is Christ, I put it in that hole in my heart, it fits perfectly, it's full, it will never run through. I will never be empty. But sometimes we remove that rock Sometimes we start to fill it with sand, we get distracted, we listen to the lie of the devil, and our eyes leave Jesus, and we start to notice other stuff. What I want to ask you today, what's the sand in your life? God's talking to your heart right now, and it's not a bad thing. When God gave me this message for me, I just share what he tells me, When he gave this message for me, I had to make a list of the sand in my life. Say, man, Lord, that was sneaky. He got me on that one. The devil really snuck that one in there, and I didn't realize it. Could be all sorts of stuff. But if you feel any type of void, if you say to yourself, I'm going to church, I'm going to Bible studies, I'm reading the scriptures, I'm hanging out with some friends, but what do I still lack? If you have a lacking, it's because you've replaced something sandy into your heart when only Jesus can fill that void. What I'm hoping today is that God is stirring up in your heart your need for Jesus. But I'm also hoping that you'll take a different path because the Bible never mentions this rich young ruler again. He went away sad because he thought of all I had to give up rather than all I had to gain. Today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. When I was a high school student, I was in a small Sunday school class, and my Sunday school teacher said, I want to ask you all a question. If you were to die today, how sure are you that you'd go to heaven? And I remember looking around the room and saying, well, I'm better than that guy, so I got a little better chance. And Oh, man, that's a really strong Christian there. And Well, she's useless, so I'm going to rise. And I gauged myself, and she didn't embarrass us. She didn't make it where we had to say it aloud, but I gave myself 80%. So I was a good kid. I even had hair. 80%. And I thought, that's pretty good. Can anyone really know? 
And then she said, if you were not 100% sure, then you're not saved. I said, whoa. And when I thought about that, she said, you have 0% chance or 100% chance to get into heaven. And I thought, this is, I need to know how to get into heaven. She read me John 3.16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him, uh, sorry, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him. I was like, boy, that believe word stuck out because I thought it was do good works. Whoever does good works in him. But it was just believe. And then Romans 10.9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That day, my sophomore year in high school, I gave my life to Jesus and I've never looked back. I am saved for all eternity and I'm a work in progress until God takes me home. I'm hoping that today, if you're somebody in this room, that you will give your life over to Jesus like I did my sophomore year. God got me through that beautiful section of my life and he's brought me through so much more and he's given me hope in a hopeless world and he's the rock of my salvation. At this point, if that's you, I'd love for everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes as we get ready to pray. You might be saved here. This is a prayer that you can pray a hundred times, 500 times. You can never pray it enough. And I would ask that you would pray with me this prayer. If you're somebody here today with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to give your life over to Jesus, you've been chasing sand. You've been trying to fill the void in your heart with everything but God, like my friend was. If that's you, would you raise your hand and say, I want to give my life to Jesus today. You might be the person, there's hands up. You might be the one who's just, I don't know if I want to do it today. Pro tomorrow is not promised. Raise your hand today. Give your life to Jesus. You don't have to be perfect. He'll fix you. Come just as you are, and then let him take you through a process of restoration. You can put your hands down. And for those who are here, like I've done so many times, maybe you know you're saved. You've been walking with God. But you need to recommit your life. I've been distracted, Lord. My business has swallowed up my attention. My pursuit of happiness has swallowed up my attention and I've moved, removed you from my heart way too often and you wanna recommit your life. If that's you, would you raise your hand today as well and just say, Lord, I'm recommitting, rededicating my life to you and I'm trusting you'll regenerate me. Well, I'm gonna lead us all in a prayer right now and I'd love for everybody to say this prayer, Christian or non-Christian, if you are somebody who's giving your life to Jesus, the heart of these words will secure your eternity as a born-again Christian. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I confess I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Today I accept him as my Lord and Savior. Take control of my life Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Father God in heaven, I am so, so thankful for your love, your mercy, and your grace. I pray for every soul in this room, Father, that you've touched their hearts in a way that they've reconnected to you. I pray, Father, that you would guard us and watch over us from the enemy who's gonna try to distract us with whatever he can, but that you would keep our eyes focused on you, that the void in our lives that can only be filled by you would constantly be the rock of salvation. Lord, remove the sand in our lives that distract us, that lie to us, that just satiate us for a little bit, but really don't bring us meaning and purpose. Help us to follow your son whom you sent for all of us and in whom we have the hope of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless amen. you.